I'm not ashamed. What would be the consequences for the Amalekites attacking Israel? This is the question we seek to answer today as we continue our verse by verse study of the book of Exodus on walking the Bible. It's worth the glory of his cross. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to be reading from verses 8 to 16. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So, Exodus chapter 17, beginning at verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. In our last episode, we had the children of Israel camping at Rephidim. There, again, they complained to God about having no water. God had provided for them all along their journey, yet they still found opportunity to complain. The situation was so bad that Moses feared for his life. God again would provide for Israel, this time by having Moses strike the rock with his rod and water would come out. Moses did as the Lord commanded and the water that was provided saved Israel from dying of thirst. All of this brings us to today's reading. In verse 8, we find that the children of Amalek came and fought Israel in Rephidim. When we were studying Genesis, we even studied the chapters with a list of names, saying that doing so would help us in our future studies. Well, here is one of those instances. In Genesis 36, verses 9 to 12, we read, And this is the genealogy of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These were the names of Esau's sons, Aliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau, and Ruel, the son of Basimath, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatim, and Kenaz. Now Timnah was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. So as we just read, Amalek is a descendant of Esau, and would thus be a Semitic people related to the Israelites, though not through Jacob, but through Esau. Where do the Amalekites live? For that, we need to turn to 1 Samuel 15, verse 7. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. The Amalekites live from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Now, these names might not mean much to you, but we have run into them before in our study of Genesis. In Genesis 25, 17 and 18, we read, These were the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go towards Assyria. He died in the presence of all his brethren. The children of Ishmael, like the children of Amalek, live from Havilah to Shur. Shur is east of Egypt, and we find that Havilah is as you go towards Assyria. Therefore, looking at our map, here you find the region of the Amalekites is the region that is mostly contained in what we call Saudi Arabia today. They did not extend into the Sinai, as some think, for that would be into the territory of the Egyptians. And while they might have extended into the Negev in southern Canaan, the territory you see on the map is their traditional land, as 1 Samuel 28, verse 7 says. Thus, if Israel is, as we contest in Arabia, heading towards Mount Sinai, it would make perfect sense as to why the Amalekites were one of the peoples to attack Israel at Rephidim, for they lived in the area. Seeing over two million people enter in an area would be seen as a threat that needed to be defeated. If Rephidim is in today's Sinai Peninsula, then it wouldn't make any sense as to why the Amalekites attacked Israel there, for they didn't even live there. This is yet another biblical reason that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia and not in the Sinai Peninsula. Getting back to Exodus 17, we find our first reference to Joshua in Scripture. Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim and would become the future leader of Israel after the death of Moses. He told Joshua to select some men to go out and fight Amalek. The battle wouldn't be fought as we would expect, though. Moses said that he would take his rod and stand up on a high hill. When Moses raised his arms, the Israelites would prevail in battle. 
But when Moses lowered his arms, the Amalekites would prevail. The battle raged on all day, and so it was only natural for Moses' arms to get tired. They went and gathered a stone for Moses to sit on, and Aaron and a man named Hur, another prominent man in Israel, who, according to some in Jewish tradition, was Miriam's husband, held Moses' arms up during battle. So it was that Israel, through Joshua, defeated the Amalekites with a great slaughter that day. However, because Amalek chose to battle Israel in the first place, a nation that meant them no harm, the Lord told Moses to write down a memorial of this day in a book, what we call the book of Exodus, and recount it to Joshua so that it would be remembered. As part of what Moses was to write was that the Lord vowed to one day utterly destroy the Amalekites from under heaven. It would be a while in our study until we see the fulfillment of this prophecy, but it will happen, at least in part, in 1 Samuel 15, and be completed in the days of Hezekiah in 1 Chronicles 4.43. Moses then built an altar there and called its name, The Lord is My Banner, which in the Hebrew would be Jehovah Nisi. The word banner here is used in a military context, meaning that fighting under Jehovah's banner, with Jehovah as their leader, would mean certain victory. This should have shown Israel that if God was with them, nobody could defeat them. Sadly, it is a lesson they would soon forget. With that, our time is up today. Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of Exodus 18, verses 1 to 6, as we continue our walk through the Bible. One verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world.